Well, good morning, church. Y'all doing all right? Y'all survived Halloween last night. I don't know about you, it, is, it felt like the twilight zone in our neighborhood, um, mainly because half the neighborhood was without power, so you didn't know, like, whose house to go to, or it was just weird. And then, so, like, the front of the neighborhood, you're walking, I'm like, I don't really know, we didn't see any other kids for, until, like, 20 minutes into it, so it was kind of interesting. So I just told my kids, you know, when they come across a bucket that's on the front porch, just dump it all, because there's not any kids. Just kidding, I didn't tell them that, Okay. I did not tell them that, but it's good to see you. I know uh, with Halloween, it could be crazy, but thank God for an extra hour of sleep. Um, Hope that you enjoyed that. I know I needed it, Um, but it is good to see you this morning. If it's your first time, my name is Dustin, and I'm the campus pastor here, and it's great um, to see you, and I hope that you have an awesome, awesome morning. But um, a couple things um, as we get started. Um, We start this, this new series called Second Nature, and I don't know about you, but I have some things in my life that I would consider second nature. There is things that I do without even thinking about them. Um, They're just a part of who I am. For instance, um, every single morning when I wake up, I go downstairs, I turn on our Keurig, I put a little cake cup in it, I brew a cup of coffee, I put way too much flavored coffee creamer in it. Any flavored coffee creamer fans? Okay, yeah. All the guys are like, you're not a man. Um... I drink it black, all right, but uh, but anyway, I take, I put a ton of, I like a little coffee with my creamer, to be honest, and so, put all the creamer in it, then I go, and I have my spot on our sectional in our living room, and I, every morning, I sit there, and I drink a, a cup of coffee, maybe for five, ten minutes, maybe 15 or 20, I don't know, just to kind of wake up, and kind of get the motor going, you know what I'm saying, and maybe um, I'll have a quiet time, read some scripture, pray during that time, but it's just second nature, I don't even think about it, I come downstairs, and it's like, just, it's just part of my routine. Or um, here's a weird one that's second nature for me, um, is that every time I get into a vehicle, I always turn on the headlights. Now, I don't know why I started that, but like in my truck or in Sloan's van, I always turn on the headlights. Sloan gives me a hard time. She's like, it's 12 o'clock, it's noon. Like, why are you driving with headlights on? Um, I just do it. If, I, if I've ever rented a vehicle or if I borrow your vehicle someday, I'm gonna turn on the headlights. For, I don't know why, it's just second nature for me to do that. Another one that I experienced uh, last night, that's why I bring it up, anytime I have something sweet or a dessert, I need a large glass of milk. Anybody? Uh, Okay? I just have to have milk. There is no way that I can eat Halloween candy or cookie or piece of cake or whatever without a huge glass of milk. And so once the kids went down uh, for bed, I went and took the dad tax, you know, Got to teach them about the IRS at an early age, or some would call that communism, I don't know. But I took, <laughs> I took their candy and ate some with a glass of milk. It's just second nature. There's no, I can't not eat sweets and not have a glass of milk. And if you think about it, in our lives, we all have different little quirky things about us that are second nature. And we just do them, not even thinking about it. It's just who we are. And as believers, as followers of Jesus... There should be in us habits and spiritual disciplines that are second nature. There should be things that we don't even have to think about it. We just do it because it's a part of our identity. And so over the next six weeks in this series, Second Nature, we're going to be talking about um, some things that as we navigate Scripture, some things that Jesus taught and that we see throughout the Bible that are those habits, are those disciplines to make us more like Jesus that we go through what's called the sanctification process as followers of Christ, meaning that we're stripping away the sin and the nastiness in our life to be more like Jesus and pursuing things that are holy and righteous. And so we're going to look at those things over the next six weeks. And in order to be more like Jesus, we really have to first start with the question, do you want to be more like Jesus? That as followers, that should be a no-brainer. That should be a resounding Yes, that's the whole purpose of being a follower. It's not raising your hand, um, giving your life to Jesus, and now you have your little fire insurance from hell. It should be an ongoing process that we are growing in our faith to be more like Christ. And so this morning, we're starting with the spiritual discipline of prayer, right? And so I kind of joked with some friends last night. I was like, I'm talking about prayer. So I was going to read a passage on prayer, would pray for 10 minutes, and then we'd all just be dismissed. Does that sound good? No, just kidding. Don't, don't answer that, okay? Uh, but uh, no, we're going to look at prayer this morning. And prayer is so foundational. I mean, you think about it, Jesus' life and his ministry were saturated in prayer. You look all throughout the Gospels, and it was so important to Jesus. From him being baptized, he prayed at his baptism. 
at when he was in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil. He prayed through that. Before he chose his 12 disciples, he prayed the night um, before that God would give him wisdom in that. He talked, talks a lot about prayer. The disciples ask him, hey, how do we pray? So he teaches them uh, um, how to pray. If you remember, he also prays the night before he's betrayed and arrested and eventually led to the cross. Cross. He prays in that moment, John 17, the high priestly prayer. And so he's praying throughout this ministry. And just to be honest, if, if it's something that Jesus is doing and he's teaching about, about it and modeling it, it's important for our lives as believers to say, hey, prayer should be something that's a part of our everyday life. He modeled it and talked about it. Um, theologian and um, author D.A. Carson, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, a uh, big theologian, he said, if you really want to embarrass the average Christian, ask them to tell you about their private prayer life. And the reason he says that is because for many of us, myself included, that we struggle through this um, habitual discipline of prayer, that it, it's, it's one of those things where we're like, ah, I don't really know if I pray throughout the day. I don't know how often and how disciplined I am with that. And it's really, really important um, as we see in Jesus. I mean, let's think about this. It's easy for us to say the blessing at a meal, right? Now, we can just say the blessing, and maybe it's like a little rhyme or something, or maybe it's our nighttime prayers with our kids. If you have littles at home, that you say a little prayer, bedtime prayer, and that's to a rhyming song or whatever the case is. Those are easy. I would even say it's easy to pray when you have a need. And you go to God and you're like, hey, I really need you to do this. Maybe there's a family member that's sick or diagnosed with something. And it's really easy in those times to ask God for prayer. Or maybe you grew up Catholic or playing sports. Like, you know, I remember praying the Lord's Prayer before a football game. And this never made any sense to me because everybody's using language like sailors and truck drivers, you know. And then it's like the coach is like, everybody get together, hold hands, take a knee. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. And I'm like, okay, well. You just, you know, called everybody, everybody names. <laughs> so what, what, what's the point of that? But you recite it. And so what happens is that prayer becomes more out of convenience and ritual than it does a priority and a relationship. And, and that is so true in our lives. And then if you look at the early church, you look, so Jesus is gone. And you look at the foundation, the formation of the early church and early believers in the book of Acts. And prayer was so fundamental to everything that, was, that, that they were encountering. And think about it, that was a time where people were coming to know Jesus left and right, and the church was exploding and expanding all across the region because they were devoted to prayer. Just a couple of examples, and you can, you can go look at it yourself, but in Acts, Acts 1, it says they all joined together constantly in prayer. Acts 2, they, they devoted themselves to prayer. Acts 4, 24, they prayed for an outpouring of signs and wonders in the midst of persecution. Acts 6 says that the apostles devoted themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So they were both considered, the teaching of the word and prayer were both considered ministries. Not just preaching, but prayer was a ministry of the early church. In 12, 5, the church prayed for Peter to be released um, in 13.2, they, they were praying that God would raise up missionaries. In 14.23, they appointed elders through prayer. Paul's ministry was described as one that was all about preaching, healing, and prayer. And so literally, if you went through the book of Acts, in every single chapter, you would find a devotion to prayer. And it was fundamental to the early church, to the early believers, and I think my concern, and I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but was that what was fundamental to the early church has become supplemental to the modern church. That what was so foundational and funda fundamental of this is what we do. We pray before anything and everything. Now for the modern church, it's more of a, hey, do they have a good kids ministry? What about their student ministry? Is the worship good? Is the preaching good? Um, how, how about their host team? I had a park far away. I don't really like that. It, it, it was foundational for them to be devoted to prayer. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, we're going to see what Jesus had to say about this. Uh, I think for many of us, um, you know, this lack of prayer, it really is a dependency problem. A lack of prayer is a dependency problem, and Jesus is about to kind of talk through that 
And for many of us, we just simply don't do it. And, um, and so it's this trust issue that we have with Jesus. And so let's read what he is saying in uh, Matthew 6, um, starting in verse 5. He says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Wow, that's a good way to start off this morning, right? For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. And truly I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, now that's not an excuse for you to be like, oh, well, I pray. Well, I've never seen you pray. Well, that's because I go into my closet. <laughs> okay, that's not an excuse. He's using this as an illustration. Verse 7, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And pray then like this. So this is the famous Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And then he closes with fasting. We're not going to get into this this morning, but verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. So you see the same language um, then as earlier in the chapter. Um, but then when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that, you, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And so great passage of teaching. And I know a lot of times when you hear this passage and you read this scripture, we start walking through the Lord's Prayer of how you should pray. And if we don't want to hit that this morning. What I want to hit on is really the heart. That when you pray, how, how do you come before the Lord? What does that look like in this intimate relationship with Jesus? What does it mean? And I think the very first thing that Jesus is pointing out here is that when we pray, we need to be sincere. We need to be sincere. We need to come to him in this intimate relationship and not try to look like we have it all together and try to be someone that we're not, but to be totally transparent and vulnerable and genuine and real and authentic before Christ. Now, not growing up in church, I don't have a lot of, I didn't um, at the time have a lot of experience to prayer. And I remember some friends of mine, I had just became, uh, just became a Christian and some friends of mine invited me to um, this thing at my church at the time that we would eat um, and meet before school. So the church was right across from the neighborhood that I grew up in. And I'm like, there's food there? Yes. And I'll be honest, that's why I went, okay? And so I went, and there was this guy, I'll never forget, his name was Abe Abernathy. He was a parent, a dad of um, some kids in the student ministry. And he would cook this huge meal before school. I'm talking like biscuits and gravy and bacon and sausage and hash browns and eggs. And, you know, as a 14-year-old dude, I'm like, yes, please, right? So I show up early in the morning. That's about anything, that, that's about the only thing that would get me up that early. And so I, I show up, I'm eating this meal, and we're going to go to school. Well, lo and behold, I didn't know this, but it was also a prayer time, <laughs> okay? So I got, got like suckered into this. So the youth pastor, after we all eat, he's like, hey, before y'all go to school, and why don't we just circle up and, uh, and pray, so I'm thinking he's going to pray or whatever. Then he continues. I don't know if you've been in this moment. If you've been in church, you know this. We all circle up. There's like 15 or 20 of us holding, our, holding hands. And he's like, okay, we're going to start with this person, and we're just going to go around the circle. Everybody pray out loud. And then you close this out, whoever. And then he's like, and then I'll close this in prayer. Have you ever been a part of something like that? Okay. Now, I had never done that. And, and at this point, I think I maybe had prayed like once or twice. And to be honest, it was like, to ask Jesus into my life, and that the Braves would win the World Series. Like, literally, that was it, okay? And, and so I, I get there, and I'm thinking, okay, well, people are praying, and there's just awesome prayers. And it's really inspiring to hear, like, your peers in high school pray. 
But as it gets closer to me around the circle, my palms are sweating. I'm like, I feel bad for the people I'm holding hands with next to it. They're like, oh, my gosh, this guy's got a medical issue. And so my, my palms are, are sweating, and I'm like rehearsing in my head, what am I going to say? Right? Because I didn't want to look like an idiot in front of all these people. And so at the time, my grandmother was dying of cancer. And so the only thing I thought of, and I said it as fast as possible, like literally, it got to me. And I said, heal my grandma who has cancer. Amen. <laughs> and it was like, next, all right. Go around. Went all the way around. And I just remember at the end of that being like embarrassed. And so I went to some my friends who invited me. I was like, man, that was like the stupidest prayer. I, don't, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know we were going to do that. I've never prayed like that before. And they told me, who cares about your words? That's what's in your heart, all right? And I say that because twofold. It, it was, I was genuine. I was sincere in it. Even though I didn't really know what to say, I was sincere. But there was also a guy that every time he was a, um, a youth volunteer, and every time he prayed, I felt so, so dumb because he was really smart. But when he prayed, he would use, like, really big theological terms, right? Like, have you ever met any, anybody like that? So he's, like, praying. He's like, oh, holy heavenly father, you know, we're so blessed by your hypostatic union between Christ and ourselves and the dispensationalism that's in our world. I'm thinking, what are you talking Like, who talks like that, right? Who talks like that? And I just remember my Sunday school, like, small group leader told me, just have a conversation with God. Just be real. And that's what prayer is, is prayer is this, let's just be genuine it, before God, the creator. And Jesus is saying, don't be like them. He says, don't be like the hypocrites who go out in public and want everybody to see how they pray. And they're really trying to impress others other than just coming to God and being genuine. Then he also says, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't just throw up these empty phrases, not really having a heart behind it and a reality that says, man, I'm being genuine in this moment. So when we pray, God, I really do believe this, God is less concerned about the words that you say than the posture of your heart. That when you come to the feet of God in prayer, just be real. Just say, hey, God, I haven't talked to you in a long time. I really don't know what to say, but I need some help. I'm struggling with a situation at my job, or I don't know how to lead my family, or my kids are going through something that's there. And so we need to be sincere in that. The second thing is that we need to be personal. We need to be personal um, in our prayers. A lot of times it's just kind of a, hey, let me just kind of throw out this generality. Man, be with Jesus. Get personal with him. Um, I was out walking our dog, well, I say walking, I was taking her out, and I was in the driveway, and the newspaper lady was driving by, and I don't know if you have these in your neighborhood, I don't even know why we get the newspaper, we don't pay for it, um, but she comes around, I'm not complaining, I don't even read it, I just use it for fire, firewood stuff, so, but she ch comes around our neighborhood, and have you ever seen this, like, she's driving like 25, 30 miles an hour, and like throwing newspapers into people's yard, and so I'm out there with my dog, and I'm in the driveway, and she comes by like Jeff Gordon, you know, and she throws out the newspaper, and it like hits the driveway and slides right at my feet. And at first, I was like, dang, she almost hit me. <laughs> you know, I'm like, she's trying to take me out. But then I realized, I'm like, no, dang, that takes some skill. She saw me there and was like, I'm going to put it right on his feet. Watch this. You know, like an NFL quarterback. Bam. I was like, thanks, you know. But the thing is, it happened so fast that I didn't see her face, I didn't know what was happening, you know, I was just like, wow, there's a newspaper. And I think that so often, that's how we treat our prayer life with God. That it's not very personal, it's just kind of a Hail Mary prayer, just throwing it at the feet of Jesus, and it, it, what I would call like a drive-by praying, okay? Like you just kind of go by, and it's like, hey, throw this out there to God, and let him, let him take it, and we'll just do this, and it's very impersonal, and it's just like, I'm just throwing out requests, and, and God to us is more of a butler in our service um, and in our life to ask him all these things, and it's not very personal. And Jesus, in this moment, I mean, look at the Lord's Prayer. He's saying, our Father, all right, that your kingdom, not, not my kingdom. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we also forgive give those that have wronged us, you know. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us. It was personal. It wasn't like, 
hey, just pray for everybody. Pray for my aunt over here and pray for my dog. And uh, I mean, it was personal. There was this relationship that Jesus is pointing to between him and the Father. And so it's personal because prayer is probably the most um, vulnerable and intimate time that we can have with God. And the truth is, is that prayer nurtures our personal relationship with Christ. It nurtures and grows our relationship. Now, when I think about the most personal, most intimate relationship I have, hands down, it's the relationship with my wife. We tell each other everything. And because of that, it's personal and it's intimate. Now, I'll be honest. When we first got married, it, didn't, it wasn't like that because of me. I didn't tell her everything. I didn't share. I wasn't intimate in that way to say, I'm going to share everything. I was holding back things or wouldn't tell the complete truth of things. And so it damaged our intimacy in that time frame, in that season. And so the more that we communicate, the more that we share, that we're vulnerable, that we take and spend time in our words and communication, the more intimate our marriage becomes. All right? And so, and the same is true in our relationship with God. Just for me and Sloan, I talk to her. She talks to me. And in our relationship with God, in our prayer life, it's twofold. Us talking to God and him talking to us. And so kind of subpoints if you're if you're taking notes this morning, a couple things that as we're talking to him that I think are so important in our prayer life is we um, part of our prayer life, one, as we're talking to him, needs to be confession and forgiveness. I think that's huge in our prayer life. That as you and I and every single one of us battle with sin every single day, that when we go to God, we don't need to look like we have it all together and, and we're perfect. We run to him and confess our sin and we ask for forgiveness. I mean, just as he's praying here, you know, forgive us our debts. That needs to be a principle of our prayer life that we go to God and not just say, I messed up today, God, and these generalities. I would say you need to pinpoint the sin. Hey, I shouldn't have said this to my wife. I had this lustful thought um, today at work or whatever, fill in the blank. It is pinpointed confession that you acknowledge sin and you go to God and you say this. Now, remember the story of David, King David. He has an affair with Bathsheba while Bathsheba's husband's out at war and um, finds out she's pregnant. And he's like, uh-oh. So he calls um, Uriah, her, her husband, back from war, hoping that they could spend the night together. You get the drift. He doesn't because he's like, all the soldiers are not doing that, so I'm going to stay right here at the doorstep or the um, threshold. And David's like, oh, no. So sends him back out, puts him, tells the general to put Uriah on the front lines and has him killed. And so David's baby dies, and as a consequence of his sin, and you remember, David was mad about it. And then I love the prophet Nathan comes to him and calls his butt out on the carpet and says, you're wrong. That's sin in your life. And then we see as a result, Psalm 30, uh, 51, that David writes this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out all my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So you see this confession and forgiveness. It was a part of David's prayer. And um, bless God that we, we actually have that and David's words in his writing in Psalm. Another part of prayer that's important is not only just confession and forgiveness, but worship. As Jesus points out when he starts the Lord's prayer with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Um, hallowed really means holy. Holy be your name. That your name is above everything. It is worthy of my praise and my worship. Let your, your will be done, not my own. So it's a surrender to put God in front of our passions and desires and to worship him. In 1 Thessalonians, the writer says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so part of our prayer life should be worship. Man, God, thank you so much for this. Thank you for getting me through this. Thank you for giving me the strength through this. Thanks for hearing my prayer. Thanks for being faithful, even though I'm not faithful. It's all, this repetition of not just confession and forgiveness, but our prayer life is a very important thing in our relationship to praise God and to worship God, to thank him for everything that he has done. And then 
third and finally part of our conversation with God is to ask. 1 John 5.14 says, And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we see that in the Lord's Prayer, that as Jesus is teaching, that he's going and he's saying, Hey, give us um, this day our daily bread. Let us meet our needs for today. Forgive us of those things. Lead us not into temptation. Help me with this battle of sin. So it's okay to ask God and to be confident before him to say, hey, in my prayer life, I'm going to confess and and ask for forgiveness. I'm going to worship, but I'm also going to ask. I'm going to request things. Now, don't, don't approach God and be like, God, I really need a car. You know, like mine is just a piece of junk. I really, I really like those new Ford Broncos um, that are out or those new Jeeps, you know. I mean, I guess you could pray about that. But it says according to his will. So really, once again, be sincere. Hey, what's going on in your life, in your soul, I get, you know, and just pray for those things. Go before him in this intimate setting and say, God, I want to be personal in this moment and do that. And so that's us talking to God. Now, here's the part that we often neglect is him talking to us. A lot of times we go and we request all these things, help me here and help me with this. And when was the last time, think about it, that you just sat and were still and heard the voice of God? Especially if you're, if you're a young parent, man, the kids are running. It's like I can't even get a word in edgewise. I run to the toilet and, and I'm on my phone on Facebook for 15 minutes. And I'm like, I'm going to the bathroom <laughs> just so I can get some quiet time. And the thing is, like, how do I do that? But we need to be intentional with setting aside time for us just to be still and hear a, a uh, over all the noise in our life, just to hear the voice of God. Just to rest as he's renewing our mind. As he's doing things in our life to say, man, I really needed to hear that. I love this. Last week, had a gentleman um, that was here that said, man, I heard from God this week. And it was because he just sat and was like just listening to the word of God. He hadn't been to church in a long time. And, and so it takes us being intentional with that for him to speak to our souls. And then third and finally, that not only do we need to be sincere and be personal, but this is the bottom line. We need to be dependent. We need to be dependent. That's the bottom line of prayer. That if you think about it, I mean, if you don't think you need God or you think I, I, I can do this without God or I, I don't need his help, man, your prayer life is probably very minimal if, if non-existent at that. Because what prayer is, is prayer is this transfer of dependency from us to God. It's saying, okay, I don't have what it takes. I can't do it by myself. I can't be dependent on my, I always mess up. So I need to depend on God. That's exactly what God is all about. It's it's transferring this dependency on ourselves. And I'm going to tell you, this is a big problem in American Christianity. Because if you think about it, we have everything we need. We have homes and food, and we might not have exactly what we want, but we have everything that we need. And if you've ever been to a third world country, and I will say this till, till I go home, is that when you go to a third world country and you see their faith and their trust and dependency on God, man, their prayer life is, is amazing. And, and I really do believe that because they're fully dependent on God and not themselves, that their prayer life is so intimate that they really get to experience God on a, a level that we miss out on. That they get to see miracles happen, that we're like, well, that, that's no, that can happen? Because we're not dedicated and devoted to prayer by saying, hey, I'm going I'm to give God everything. And maybe we're missing out on the miracles of God because our prayer life isn't what it should be. Our conversation and intimacy with the Lord isn't one that we run to Him and and we confess and we worship and we pray and we're fully dependent to say, hey, and this is what I love. One of our values as a church is dependency. That without prayer, we can do nothing without God. That no matter what happens at this church or no matter what happens in your life, it's all from God. And so as an invitation this morning, I mean, what if, what if we were all that dependent? And we had that, that, such an intimacy with the Lord in our time of prayer and conversation with him that we depended on him fully for everything. Man, we would see, just like in the early church in the book of Acts, we would see God do amazing things that can only be pointed to him. So let us not depend on ourselves. Let us transfer that dependency and say, God, whatever. And so take a step this morning. Take a step this week. Maybe start to begin to pray as a family. 
we don't do that. Pray in the morning. Let it become second nature in your life where it's a, a routine and something that is so instilled of who you are that you're in, um, nurturing that relationship with Christ. Let me pray for us, and the band will close us in worship. Father, we're so thankful that we have an opportunity to come to you and have a conversation. So often we, um, we're scared of, of coming to you. Maybe it's out of shame or guilt. And that's Satan, the devil, the enemy, trying to throw that at us. Maybe we feel inadequate. We don't know what to say and really how to come to you and to approach you with this thing. But, Father, I pray that as we see in Jesus' words, he says, hey, don't be like them. Don't just pray for everybody to see because it's an intimate, personal time. And as you pray, confess and worship and, and ask for these things. Have confidence that the Lord hears. And so let us approach you in the same way. And as we come, as we ask for forgiveness, as we ask for different things that are going on in our lives and that we're struggling through and we need to see you show up, Father, let, let that become second nature in our lives. Let us depend on you in such a way that we do nothing without prayer. And Father, I, I just long for the day that every single one of us in this room and at this church, that God, that we have such an intimate prayer life with you. That what happens in our lives and what happens through our church and in this community and at our jobs and in our families is only uh, pointed back to you, can only be described by your hand and your faithfulness because of our dedication to prayer and just coming to you with our request. And as we do that, let our relationship with you grow and be nurtured. In your son's name, amen. Let's stand and worship together. And if you have anything maybe you, you need some prayer about, I'll be down here at the front. If you want to take a step in baptism or coming to know Jesus for the first time, we'd love to talk to you about that. But um, let's worship together a God who is in control of all things and wants to hear from his people.